Greetings, everyone. Here are some additional examples for section 5.3. Um, if you didn't watch the other videos that I posted for section 5.3 or you haven't had any experience with 5.3, uh, you won't really understand what I'm about to talk about here, at least not well. So you, you'd want to go watch the other video first. So please go do that. All right. So the, just to recap briefly, uh, the majority of the beginning of section 5.3 is about the evaluation theorem. And the evaluation theorem gives us an analytical way of evaluating a definite integral where we're going to evaluate the definite integral by, uh, and here's our definite integral on this side over here from A to B, of um, definite integral from A to B of fx dx. And to do that, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, do this, whoops, do this side over here. And what this side is telling us is we want to find some antiderivative of lowercase um, of lowercase f. Okay, so notice that uh, where I have this, where capital F prime is equal to lowercase f. That means I need some antiderivative, an antiderivative, not the most general. I don't need the plus c here because, um, as mentioned in the previous notes, notes the plus c will be uh, eliminated in the di in the difference. And so what I need to do is find some antiderivative of lowercase f, and then I'm going to plug in the upper limit of integration, plug in the lower limit of integration, and then subtract the two values, and that is a way I could get an analytical value for the definite integral without having to appeal to geometry or without having to use an approximate method like using uh, a Riemann sum, using some rectangles or trapezoids or something like that to get an approximation. Um, the, the, this is good. This gives us an efficient way of doing this. When we can find an antiderivative of a lowercase f, and that's another issue that we'll have to talk about at some point, maybe in more detail, uh, but it's not always easy or even possible to find a, uh, an antiderivative of a lowercase f, so keep that in mind. So let's uh, see if we can apply this theorem, and i got a bunch of examples for us to try in this. So our first example here is the definite integral from 1 to 8 of the cube root of x. So as the evaluation theorem tells us, we need to find an antiderivative of the cube root of x. And then we can plug in 8, and then we can plug in 1, and their difference would be the result. It would be wise for you right now to pause the video and see if you can do those steps by yourself, and then check the work with what I do momentarily. So hopefully you did that. Hopefully you are able to pause the video and see what's going on. The way I would suggest going about this is to first rewrite the integrand, the cube root of x, in terms of the fractional exponent, um, in terms of a fractional exponent. So it's going to be x to the one-third power. And so um, what we need to do now is we need to um, reverse the power rule to find an antiderivative of x to the one-third power. So we're going to add one, uh, one to the one-third, and one plus one-third is four-thirds, so I'm going to put x to the power of four-thirds. And then, of course, we need to divide by that new exponent, but dividing by uh, four-thirds is the same as multiplying by three-fourths. So I'll put that in front as a multiplier there. And then I'll put uh, my limits of integration over here off of uh, this bar, which tells me uh, how I need to evaluate this. So that means um, we're going to have three-fourths times x to the four-thirds, and then we're going to subtract from that three-fourths times 1 to the 4 thirds. I think I might have said the first one. 3 fourths times 8 to the 4 thirds minus 3 fourths times 1 to the 4 thirds. And that'll be our final answer for this. All right, so um, just running through this, uh, the 8 to the 4 thirds power, we can do the cube root first because the 8 has a nice cube root. The cube root of 8 is 2 and then becomes 2 to the 4th power. And 2 to the 4th power, hopefully you know, is 16. And then 1 to the 4 thirds is just 1, so it looks like this. And if I can squeeze this on here, uh, 3 fourths of 16 is 12, so 12 minus 3 fourths. And then, uh, you know, so 11 and a quarter or 11.25 or, you know, 45 fourths, however you want to write it. Looks like that. So let me just point out to you that... Um, we, we have our answer, okay, the answer being this uh, 11 to the 1 fourth power. And just to put this into some interpretive context like we've done before, what does that tell us about this quantity here? Well, if you recall, the definite integral represents graphically the area bounded by the curve, 
above by the curve, below by the x-axis, on this interval from 1 to 8, provided the, the function is non-negative, which it is. The cube root is non-negative here. So if you were to graph the cube root of x and look on the interval from 1 to 8, the amount of area bounded by that curve in the x-axis on this interval would be 11 and a quarter. So you should always try to keep in mind what this result is telling us graphically, analytically, okay? So there's that example. Here's another example. Um, uh, please pause the video, go back and give this one a shot, and see if you can do this on your own, and then you can check your work with me momentarily. All right, so hopefully you have an answer to check with what we do. Now, what I can't do here, I have a product in my integrand. I can't take the antiderivative of each expression in the product separately and then multiply the results. We don't have a rule for that. Uh, we had a rule for... Uh, evaluating the um, sum or difference separately and then combining the results, but not for products or quotients. So we have to do uh, some algebra first here. So hopefully you took the, the integrand here and expanded it first before actually doing any calculus here. So, you know, I'm just going to bring my integral from 0 to 2 along, and we're going to multiply this out. So we're going to end up with a 2y squared... And then I'm going to, you know, kind of go through this quickly. We have, we're going to have a positive y minus 2y, which gives us a negative y here. And then we're going to end up with a negative 1 and then dy. So now what we need to do is uh, apply the evaluation theorem. So always simplify the integrand if there's some algebra, um, you know, multiplication. Let me be clear. Multiplication or division to do first. And then you can go ahead and apply the evaluation theorem. All right, so applying the evaluation theorem, taking the antiderivative of 2y squared, um, that's going to be 2 thirds y cubed. And remember, we're reversing the power rule, so I'm adding 1 to the exponent 2 to get that new 3, and then I have to divide by that new exponent. Uh, that's why we have 2 divided by 3, because that 2 that was a constant out there just went along for the ride. And then Antiderivative of y will be 1 half y squared. That's, again, adding 1 to the exponent of 1 to get a 2, dividing by that new exponent to give the 1 half. And then minus, well, the antiderivative of 1 is just y by itself. Remember, we're using an antiderivative. I don't need to have a plus c because they'll be just, so if I did, I'll have subtractions of c's uh, in the end. So this needs to be evaluated from 0 to 2. So I'm using brackets around this because inside all of this, there's some addition, or rather some subtraction that needs to happen. And so just to be clear that the 0 to 2 applies to every single term. Excuse me. So let's see here. If I can squeeze all this over here. So I'm going to plug in the 2 to every single term. And when I do that, I'm going to get 2 thirds of 8. Whoops. 2 thirds of 8 and then minus half of 4, and then minus 2. I also need to plug in 0, but luckily when I plug in 0, and then I'm going to subtract that result, everything is 0, so I'll have a minus 0, which doesn't need to be written, but just to make sure you're following along and I'm not leaving anybody behind. Um, we'll do that. So we get 16 thirds, that's uh, 2 thirds times 8, 16 thirds. And I wrote this wrong over here. Hopefully you caught that this should have been just a 1 half. Um, I said one half of four, but I wrote one fourth of four, sorry. And so that becomes a, a minus two and another minus two. And so this is 16 thirds minus four or 16 thirds minus 12 thirds, which becomes just four thirds. All right, so hopefully you got that. Here's the next one. Again, please pause the video, go try this yourself, and then you can come back and watch and see how I did it. So, there's a couple different ways of starting this one. Um, what you can do is take the 4 and bring this out as a multiplier over here, and that might help you recognize what's happening in the integrand um, a little bit more clearly. So, let's do that. We're going to use our constant multiple rule. I gave this to you as a theorem or property. I don't remember which, but I gave it to you in uh, the notes. I think it's just a property, but so this is what our integrand becomes after we do this constant multiple rule. 
Now remember, to evaluate the definite integral, we need to use the evaluation theorem, which means we need to find an antiderivative of 1 over t squared plus 1. Hopefully you recognize that uh, this integrand is the derivative of the arc tangent function, so we're finding, in finding an antiderivative, we're going to have the arc tangent function, arc tangent of t. And then we just need to evaluate that from 0 to 1. All right, so continuing from there, uh, four times we need to have the arc tangent of 1 minus the arc tangent of 0. So you might not remember much about um, the arc tangent graph. Um, if that's true, then you might have trouble evaluating this. Um, think about it this way. Arc tangent of 1 means that the tangent of some angle has to be 1. So hopefully you know uh, that the, uh, w for what angle the tangent of that angle equals 1. And that's from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 exclusive, um, if you want some more details on that. So there's only one answer to this. It's pi over 4. Think about your 45, 45, 90 special right triangle. The tangent of 45 or the tangent of pi over 4 is the opposite leg over the adjacent leg. Those legs are equal in that triangle, so the ratio is going to be 1. And hopefully, if you can think about the graph of arctangent, um, it goes through the origin. Or you can think about the tangent of some angle equals zero, and that's also uh, you know, telling us that it's zero. So the answer to this is pi. All right, another example. Um, go ahead and pause the video, see what you can do with this one. Well, hopefully you tried something here, but I'm anticipating that if you did try this on your own, you made a common mistake that most people make when they uh, are first learning how to do this. What you should not have done is you should not have tried to find the antiderivative of 2x minus 1 and leave that in absolute value symbols and then just plug in the 2 and the 0 and subtract. That does not work, okay, generally speaking. Um, what we have to do, well, let me rephrase that. There are a couple different ways of approaching this problem, and I'm going to show you both ways. One way is to interpret this graphically, what this definite integral represents. And we've talked about this before many times already, although uh, it's still fa fairly new. I, I keep mentioning it because it's important. The definite integral, if the function is non-negative, will represent the area bounded by that curve in the x-axis. So we're talking about just the absolute, this absolute value graph, which will be non-negative, will uh, never go below the x-axis. And so this is just the area bounded by that curve. So the best thing to do right now would be to go ahead and graph this and use geometry to find the uh, result. You should pause the video and go see if you can do that on your own. All right, so I'll pause the video to make this picture of it so that uh, you don't have to watch me on, on, while recording. Create the video. But it's an absolute value graph, and it hits the x-axis at x equals 1 half. And, and at 2, the output is 3. At 0, the output is uh, a half. And so, hold on. I realized right when I said that at zero it's one half that that was a mistake and I had to go back and uh, relook at my work. Uh, when x equals zero, the output's going to be one, so it should look like this. And so this is just two triangles that we're trying to find the area bounded by or find the area of. And so all we need to do is go in here. Whoops, it's a little bit too big of a stroke. Let me let me use this in here. We're just trying to find the area of these two triangles here, and then add them together. And so, well, what do we have here? We have 1 is this uh, height and 1 half is this base. Then over here we have 1 and a half is the base of this bigger triangle here. 1 and a half from here to here. And then we have 3 over here. So we just got to find the area of these two triangles, sum them up, and that'll be the area bounded by this uh, function. So let's squeeze this in up here. We're going to get um, a half times 1 divided by 2 or times another half plus let's see we got one and a half times 3 divided by 2 and then again just got to total this up here so what do we got a fourth plus um, 
Let's see, that's nine fourths, which looks like ten fourths, or five halves, two and a half, looks like the area bounded by this curve. All right, so what about another way? Let's see. Well, another way of doing this is to take a look at this analytically. Now, if you remember analytically, every time we've dealt with the absolute value symbols, we've always tried to break this up around where the function transitions from being positive to negative. And so, if you, you know, looking back at the graph, uh, the transition point is at x equals one half. So, we would have to break this up into two different intervals from x equals um, zero to one half, of the absolute value of 2x minus 1 dx plus the integral from 1 half to 2 of the absolute value of 2x minus 1 dx, squeezing it in there. And so we could do each one separately here by applying the definition of the absolute value symbol. Now from 0 to 1 half, the absolute value of 2x minus 1 would be a rather 2x minus 1 would be negative, so the absolute value of, two, of 2x minus 1 would become the opposite of 2x minus 1. This is from 0 to 1 half. And then from, from 1 half to 2, the at 2x minus 1 is always positive, and so the absolute value does nothing to the expression, so it stays as 2x minus 1, like this. And we can evaluate each of those definite integral separately using the evaluation theorem and combine them, and we should get the same five halves. Now, I'm getting a little bit paranoid about the recording length, or the, the length of this recording, uh, because there's a, a light that keeps flashing on, like I'm going to be coming up to a, a predetermined time limit. So I'm going to work this out um, by pausing the video, and then you can look at the results um, just so I can save the recording time. All right, so... I squeezed the rest of the work on the next page, so I'll show you that momentarily. Um, but I found, I distributed the negative uh, in front of the expression here. I distributed that, and then mentally, took the antiderivative, negative 2x, its antiderivative will be negative x squared, the antiderivative of positive 1 will be x, and then evaluated from 0 to 1 half. And then the anti and antiderivative of 2x will be x squared over here, and then antiderivative of negative 1 will be negative x, evaluated from 1 half to 2. Um, I rewrote that on the top of the next page here, and then i got to evaluate those. So I plugged in the 1 half, and then got negative 1 fourth plus a half, plugged in 0, got 0, and subtracted. Plugged in 2, got 4 minus 2, and then subtracted from that what, it, what, got, what, it, what I get when I plug in 1 half. Simplified all that, and I got two and a half or five halves, just like the um, uh, geometric way that we got a little while ago. We got five halves before. The geometry is much easier. So I advise you, when you see some linear expression like that in absolute value terms, do the geometry instead of the analytical way. The analytical way is okay. It's fine. It's just a lot more work and a lot more chance for error. So I don't advise you to go through and do the analysis in that way. So I'm concerned again about recording time. Um, so that, that, those are going to be all the examples in this video, which um, I took the time to focus on the evaluation theorem. I'm going to create another video, hopefully shorter, that will deal with indefinite integrals, which was another major topic that we had from 5.3. So you're going to want to go follow up with that one after, and then go study.